today, or this, this 30 minutes, is about you. It's not about the speakers on the stage. It's about you getting the best out of today's content. So there's going to be a lot of interaction going on. So I need everyone, please, to get your device out, whether it's a tablet, a, a phone, or a computer. Grab that device now and go to slido.com. You've been using this the whole day, so hopefully many of you are familiar. If there's someone next to you who needs a bit of help, please ask and help each other out, because this kind of interaction is how we make sure you go away from today's session going, yep, yeah, I feel confident about what I'm going to do in the clinic on Monday. So when you open slido.com, you will get to the event code, which is JOSPT. Really simple. Best journal ever, I've heard. <laughs> JOSVT. So, the first thing I'd like you to do is to think of the three words that come into your mind when we say Sport Physio 2019. What, are the, what have been the key topics today? What are the challenges that you face? What do we need to make sure that we address for you to go away happy. So three words. And for some of us here, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable that the room is quiet. I'm totally comfortable with that. So please um, take the time to think and um, get, we'll get some answers up here. If anybody needs to access, does anyone need Wi-Fi? the Burn Expo Wi-Fi code, or Burn Expo free Wi-Fi. You just need to put your phone number in and get a code sent to your phone, and I'm just doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> Boris, I can see, is it working for you? No, there's a question on, but no, are you looking for a word cloud? Or? Yeah, it should be. No, I can't find it. Okay, let me just see whether I can. Okay, while we're figuring this out, let's skip across to one of the issues that came up really early on when Jeremy Lewis was discussing rotator cuff pain was this idea that many of the athletes we work with have ongoing problems that sort of simmer away beneath the surface and eventually something serious happens and then they have to stop throwing or they have to stop swimming or they have to stop climbing. And so I, re I really liked this example of how you might approach educating the athletes that you're working with, that, that you know, this is something that's got to be an ongoing management, getting used to man listening to your body, learning how to listen to your body and what's... when what it feels like when your body's saying, whoa, hang on there, and when you can go, no, this is, this is okay. So this concept of education, I think, is a really important one that transcends all that we do as clinicians. It's not just working in sport, it's working in all sorts of different uh, contexts. So the education leads us into one of the big topics of today. The words I heard over and over and over again were training load and load management. And what I'd like to do is invite, we've got three internationally re renowned experts here in load management. Um, and I'd like them to share some thoughts with us about how you would approach measuring load. So what are the key, what are their recommendations for measuring load? What are the top three metrics you might use? How often, when, and why? So I'm going to grab a couple of mics. Maretta, Martin, and Martin will ask. Ooh. Ian, can you grab the mic, please? So Maretta, maybe you might start by um, reflecting or by reinforcing this concept of load relating to injury, but how it's not just about training load. Training load's really important, but I don't think that's telling us everything, is it? There's a few other important factors to consider. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, my, my point is just that I think if we're looking at uh, sport-related injury, I think 
sport exposure, sports participation is the primary risk factors, and risk factor, and then other factors influence how much uh, training load uh, a player can tolerate. So that was m one of my main uh, points from from the talk earlier today. And I think it's a really good question. Uh, that, uh, what what is load and how can we measure it? It's it's really important. As I said earlier, what we applied was uh, was volume defined as number of hours, but obviously within these hours, the, the, the athlete can do lots of different things. So if you have the possibility and you have the systems, it's of course uh, relevant to measure um, the number of throws. It would also be really interesting to, to, to measure the velocity or the magnitude, um, the velocity of the throw, and also how, how they throw. Is it up hand, uh, upper hand or Lower, shoulder, uh, you know. So there's lots of things that it's really interesting if you want to get a better understanding of this shoulder injury concept. But the question then is, is it feasible in your setting? And I think if we if we work with the youth players, uh, I think we we need to keep it simple. And in our study, you know, ours was enough to to show something, but it certainly still have some limitations, and the results have to be. Um, be um, confirmed. Another thing is that we didn't measure the subjective load, and that might certainly also be relevant. And that can, that for, for example, that could be the RPEs uh, that Martin uh, measured. Uh, and I also think it's a good uh, thought, a good idea to measure the RPE in just not just general, but also body specific. But also there, there, there might be some methodol methodological uh, consider considerations uh, about that that actually recently was addressed in, uh, in, a, in a paper in injury prevention, I think. Uh, yep. So top three metrics, what would you say? Measure objective and sub subjective. What would you would you so, recommend some so key ones? Uh, absolutely, I think volume is important. Volume, yeah. Yeah. So uh, and, and that thing that is, that is the most feasible. And mm -hmm. then the the question, what is volume? If you if you don't have the possibility to 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 measure time, well, that's that's better than nothing. Uh, but if you have the possibility to measure the number of of, of throws, that is of course even better. So that was one, and then. Yeah, so volume, yeah, and then Martin and Martin might have some things to add. Top metrics? Yes, please. Subjective and or objective. Yeah, I think subjective is, is uh, RPEs are really useful, I think, and have them both sort of global and, and uh, joint or muscle specific um, RP. There's numerous ways to sort of measure psychological factors and well-being, soreness and st sleep, stuff like that. Yeah. And sometimes I think it's just as simple to ask the athletes, how are you feeling today? How are you doing? Um, doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Uh, we shouldn't always have to, have to use these long questionnaires. Might be tricky to know how to deal with them and, and, and get the proper answers, but just to build the confidence uh, together with the athletes so that they will actually inform you if there's something going on in the sport, outside of the sport, that would make them less sort of uh, resilient to, to participate in sports right now at the moment. So and yeah, of course, num volume is important. And for a lot of the talented youth athletes, I think it's important to sort of track the overall load volume for those athletes because they participate in your team as a coach. They participate maybe in the older team with their coach. To participate in handball or football or whatever in school, maybe regional and national teams. So there could be several sort of coaches involved. So you have to communicate with all these um, stakeholders about the athlete and the total load. Uh, I'll, I'll agree with, with what Moretta and, and Martin said. Uh, I think I think one one good point is to don't measure a lot of stuff if you can't can't use it because you will drown them, with, especially with the kids. So if you're not, at the end of the day, you're not going to use it, then, then don't measure it. It's not just for fun. It's very popular to measure a lot of stuff now, but, but measure only things that you're going to use. And I think RPE and volume is, is quite easy to measure. Um, one thing that, that perhaps you can add that, that I use with uh, the players, they often play a tournament or, or a couple of games during the weekend and then come back and we can actually measure their shoulder strength, see if we have a baseline value and then we come back and some of them have, have reduced their external rotation strength by 50% on Monday. And then we can just, okay, 
for the next couple of two days, perhaps not a lot of highway throwing, try to do something else just to getting you back on, on your normal level. I think that could be a good thing to, to measure. And so practically, how does that work? Like, do you get them to keep a diary? Do they, do you have an app? Like what, what sort of systems do you use to help keep track of this? We, we're using an app. So, so we're using a weekly report, uh, both for research, but also for, for the patients in the clinic. Uh, so every week, on Sunday, they report how many hours of match and training and your RP shoulder overall and, and lower limb. Okay. Uh, In the audience, who's working with athletes who have got access to an app for measuring load or wellness or anything? Put your hand up high so we can see it. So a couple of people. Okay. So can we give some tips? Seems like most people are not using apps. Any other simple, like, does anyone have any suggestions about simple? Is it enough to keep an Excel spreadsheet? Can we trust that the athletes keep track of it? Do we have to ask the parents or the coaches? Or how do we, how do you do, do this if you don't have an app? I think an easy way is just text message. They don't use emails, as, as Nim pointed out. We learned that the hard way when we did research. No one answered the first week. Uh, but I think just a text message. If you want to rate it, so just send two. My, my shoulder was a four, my, my overall was a five. And then, then it's up to you to collect it. So it's not a nice way for you to so get a lot of messages, but it's easy for them. Yep. I think that's, that's the way to go through. Yeah. Okay. And you, we're going to, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Russ, please. So uh, one thing I'd like to just comment about is shoulder pain and posterior cuff strength. I did a study five years ago that we'd never published, but I had a physician I worked with that injected almost every shoulder he saw. <laughs> so he would do a xylocaine injection along with cortisone. So I measured strength before and immediately after several different varieties of sh shoulder pathology. And we showed over 25 patients that uh, we had an increase in posterior cuff strength by 25%, just getting rid of the pain. So that's a point to make uh, that I use as sort of a metric with my athletes is, you know, you can have some discomfort, but I don't want you to push through a lot of discomfort. You can have some difficulty, some muscle fatigue, but that should stop immediately after the activity. You should not have prolonged pain. And if you have night pain that develops, we got a problem. We're doing too much. The other point is, as someone else said, the rotator cuff muscles are not very big. So I don't give them the throwers 15. I got to jab my buddy Kevin Wilk a little bit. 15 exercises for the rotator cuff, in my opinion, is too much. The most I give my MLB players is, is maybe five exercises. By then, the cuff is fatigued. Yeah, so it's figuring out the load that you're doing in the clinic, the load that they might be doing in other sports, the load that they might be doing in training for their main sport, and keeping track of it somehow. Let's move on um, to our next big issue I think was the scapula. So thanks Suzanne for letting me share this slide. Um, there was a, a poll question. I'm not sure that the polls are displaying on the phone. Boris, is that working for you? It says it should be working on my device, but it's not. Okay, so let's have a show of hands. Do you assess, who assesses scapular dyskinesis or dyskinesia? Okay, don't be shy, this is a safe place. We love the scapula. Yeah, so pre I think most people, maybe the best question was who doesn't assess scapular dyskinesia? It's not very many of us. So I think the question here is um, how do we do it in a way that we can trust? Because you'll all remember this lovely slide from Suzanne's presentation where, yes, we, we think the scapula is important, we want to be measuring it somehow, but it's really variable. How do we know for sure what we're measuring? So given we've got lots of experts up here. What I wanted to, to know was how do they assess the scapula? And Anne, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit first and ask you to share how would you assess the scapula in a swimmer? Okay, so I got a specific sport. Yep, specific is he healthy sport. or symptomatic? Uh, some pain. Okay. Yep. Because still swimming, still training. This is one of the first okay. things I think that we should not focus too much on scapular asymmetry in healthy athletes right. because many of them are supposed to be asymmetric because they perform asymmetric sports. So this is something you're not necessarily including in your pre-season screening of all your athletes, but it's something when someone comes in and says, I've got shoulder pain, yeah. then you're going to do I it. I think if you have a combination of shoulder pain and scapular observation of, sca of malpositioning or m 
abnormal movement, whatever you call it, you, we should at least pay attention to it just as much as we pay attention to the range of motion. It, nothing more, but nothing less. And then I think the most important thing is that you can somehow connect the symptoms to the scapular position, the scapular dysfunction, by performing these symptom reduction tests. So if your patient has pain and you can change his pain into less symptoms by changing something at the level of the scapula, like uh, Suzanne was also saying, then you prove to your patient that at least a part of his symptoms are associated with scapular malfunctioning. And so that's for me much more important than to see whether you have a type one, two, three, I don't care. And actually, as a matter of fact, for the observation, I don't give myself 10 repetitions. I just say, is it normal or not? And so if, if, it, if you have to question whether you see something, there is nothing. So if there is something, you will see it most of the time during the first movements. And it will probably aggravate by repetition. And what's the something? Like, is it the scapular winging? Is it tip? What are, what well, are you That's the for? gut feeling of the clinician, of course. We, we know from the study from Phil McClure that uh, when, when an, an educated physio says this is not normal, he compared it with 3D analysis, and it was validated in this way. So in that study, they did not only look at reliability, are we saying the same thing, but he also looked at validity. And he said, well, if you see scapular dysfunction, it is also there when you measure it with 3D analysis. So I think we should trust our eyes. And to quote Phil McClure, actually, the best 3D tracking device is our eyeball. So if you really see something, we should be convinced based on our clinical reasoning that it is there, but don't try to look for it. That's one thing. And the second thing is you have to be able to change the symptoms by helping the scapula, by helping the movement, by but put in, putting it in another position. I'm not even saying correcting the position, just to, it, when they have pain in elevation, do it with the shrugging, like I, told, like I showed uh, this morning. Do it with the posterior tilting. Is it better? Then you know what you have to treat. Yeah. Suzanne, if you were working with a climber, anything to add? You're working with a climber. Anything, yeah, anything that you would add about looking at the scapula? Again, someone who's got pain. So we're not talking about screening to predict an injury. We're talking about somebody who's complaining of problem. Well, with the climber, the, the thing is if, if he cannot clear the acromion, so he cannot reach so well, and then he will be in a very bad position to, to pull himself. So I guess uh, it's a different situation where the hand... It's a closed chain sport because you don't throw things and you just pull yourself. So it's it's a different situation. But again, you need you need everything to work. So you need to see if if he's able to retract his scapula more. Then does it help? Or yeah, I would I would do the same thing. Similar principles. Yeah. Try and hair. And if I can add now that if we compare the climber with the swimmer, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what we do, but we have to search for uh, sport-specific positions. And indeed, in the climber, it's the reverse chain. In the swimmer, we have this entrance pain, the pull-through, so we have to find out where the pain is. And in that painful condition, try to reduce the symptoms by helping the scapula. So you're only focusing on helping the scapula in those painful spots. So if it hurts here, you help the scapula yes, there. Yes, yes. If it hurts there, yeah. here, you help the scapula. And yes. this is actually, these kind of tests are the basis for your treatment. Mm -hmm. So you test not to do testing, but to, to, to define the basis of your strategy. Yeah. And Russ, do you want to add something from the th perspective of a baseball or a throwing athlete? Yeah, well, I like to do what I showed on, on my talk, which is a dynamic uh, uh, type of test. I like the dynamic test, and I think that's kind of what we're saying versus a static test. So I can demonstrate that if, if you don't mind, just real briefly here sure. on yeah. myself. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I've had all the pathologies I talk about. <laughs> 13 knee surgeries. So um, let me just use the water bottles here. So usually I use like two or three pounds, and it seems to me... The one You're going to need to use the mic. Sorry. <laughs> you, yeah. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> you earned your money, Moretta. <laughs> typically, if you do the Kibler yes or no test, I seem to find that at about 45 degrees of elevation, we demonstrate the most scapular instability. 
So we're looking for that downwardly rotated scapula, which I have. So I'll show you. As I come up into full flexion and I go down, you can see here at about 45 degrees, which scapula is it? Can you determine? People in the front row the are saying, right saying the right one. Okay, so that's the yes. There's a problem there, okay? But I've never had any pathology. I'll just stop a moment. People in the front row who could see it, what could you see? Shout it out, it's a safe place. I don't know anything about shoulders, so I'll believe you anything Scapula you say. Scapula sticking out, right? <laughs> the border, the medial border was lifting off, winging. Here, I'll yep. show it again. Once more. So well, the scapula is downwardly rotating. It yep. looks like Mike. the scapula is downwardly rotating, so it looks like it's winging, but it's actually the inferior angle popping out. Yep. So it's pointing, the, the glenoid at this point is pointing down to the ground. So when you're a throwing athlete uh, and you're, you're in that position, then you get this thing called hyperangulation, which is the difference between the angle of the humerus and the, the scapular spine. So you don't want that. So that's the one thing I look for. The other thing I do is I push with my hands below my waist against the wall. So I'll just push with my hands into the wall and you can demonstrate that scapula popping out. And so also. you're looking at the same thing. You're going to see it's that looking inferior. At the same thing. Yep. So those are two yep. things that I've used. Mm -hmm. The other yep. third thing I do is what I showed on the video, which is a manual muscle pump of the scapular muscles and see if the painful arc goes away. Kind of like what you were saying. Yeah. So if, if we can manually teach the patient to just get their arm out of the uh, activity and only use the scapular muscles to get a little bit of a muscle pump to get that upward rotation, then we lift the arm and say, my pain is completely gone. That gives you an idea of what percentage of time you need to spend on scapula versus rotator cuff. Great, thank you. So let's now move, we've got five minutes left. We're going to move to return to sport tests. Now, this was supposed to be a lovely poll where you could enter data. What I'm going to suggest is that you can write this in the Q&A part. So we're really interested to know from you, what are the tests that you use for return to sport planning and progression? But what I'm going to do is to throw it to our panel as well. So I'm going to ask Martin Asker to go back. You mentioned a couple of tests. I'm going to limit our panel members. Actually, Ian, can you start, please? <laughs> so I'm going to limit you to one. If you had to pick one test for return to play, and we can say in a rugby or in a collision sport player, what would you what would you go to first? Um, probably if I had to choose one, I'd use a closed kinetic chain upper extremity stability test, the okay. test with the longest name in the world. And yeah. so how do you do that? Because I, I know about knees, I don't know about shoulders. <laughs> how do you do that? Uh, okay, so um, you have uh, two markers on the floor which are uh, 36 <laughs> inches apart. Yep. <laughs> and then for uh, 15 seconds, what you have to do is move. Cool. So for the people up the back, what Ian's doing is moving one hand to the other. Like this. Thank Great. Thank you. Uh, and you uh, repeat. Uh, so 15 seconds, uh, 45 second uh, rest. Uh, you repeat that three times and you take the average of three readings. Now, there's uh, some literature came out recently that said for men, uh, you get a standardised score at, uh, at three, but it takes more than three tests to get a standardised score in women, but it didn't report how many uh, okay. trials you had to do. Okay, cool. And when you do that test, are you only counting or are you looking at movement quality? No, just, you're just looking at but you've got to make sure that they hit the top of the hand and the hand hits the mark each time. Okay, and it's always 36 inches apart. 36 inches, okay. yeah, it doesn't, and it's, uh, it's normalised to height okay. and, and not, uh, not to width. Okay. Suzanne, for your climb, let's go back to your climbing athlete. <laughs> What's your favourite, what would be your favourite return to sport test? Um, return to climbing test. <laughs> You're only allowed to pick one. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I, nice. I promise not to make you demonstrate it if you don't want to. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> you can, um, maybe it will be um, measuring the, the force up there. Okay. And um, How would you do it? With a dynamometer? Or yeah. How? Okay. Yeah. 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 So just hanging there with the, with the handheld dynamometer. Okay. Yeah. 
and probably I would do that. Yeah. But to how measure the, fir- in the, f- the force in, in the high level. So the person's then, feet are off the ground? They're sort of, it's almost like doing a one-arm chin-up? Yes, but they have to keep the, the feet off the gr- uh, mm-hmm. on the ground, Okay. just not lifting themselves. Yeah. And I would, I would uh, see if there is any pain doing that. Great. It's not about the, the force, but I want to make sure they push hard enough, they pull hard enough, and they have no pain. So. Okay. So, yeah, you're paying attention to yeah, symptoms yeah, and yeah. You're, lo- you're focusing symptoms. on strength. Yeah. Martin, your handball players. One test. Yeah, please. Despite my, my summary mm. of a test battery, okay? Now, then, then uh, <laughs> since, uh, since most of them are having a throwing problem, it would be a throwing test. Okay. Yeah, increasingly the throwing. And if I can add something, it would be looking for, for any strength deficit throughout that, that okay. test, any sudden drops. Uh, that's and in your throwing test, are you paying attention to symptoms or velocity, yeah. or what are you...? I, I want them to get up to that velocity, that the pre pre-injury level, uh, but, but also any of their pain. So they're allowed to feel stuff in the shoulder. For sure, they're going to do that, but not their pain. That's the pain that I have before when I was throwing. That's what we're watching out for. Yep. Yeah. Great. Can we keep on the topic of handball and go to Moretta? I'm going to skip Martin and Russ for a second. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to add a, a test? No? Yes? Or do you support what Martin's I, I advocating? I uh, support everything Martin said. <laughs> Except one thing, though, and that was that Denmark will always win gold. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't have anything to add. Okay. So sometimes or often in the clinic, you don't have the space to do a throwing test. So I have a, a clinical test for that. So now I'm not a researcher. I'm the clinician again. Uh, what I do sometimes, you have these tubes with sand in it. And so shaking tubes. And I use them to train in the final stage because you train your stretch shortening cycle both sides and I use them also as my return to throw test so if I you have different sizes if I take the smallest size and they can do that three sets of 30 seconds without pain they can go back to train and if can if can they can do it with a bigger one for three sets of a minute they are allowed to go back to competition it's a, it's motivation that counts so it's not validated not at all but it's it's uh, it's not enough i think to do strength testing here to allow them back to go to throw and we don't always have the ability to let them throw in in the clinic so you only need, need this space yeah. to do this test and but uh, yeah. It's not validated, not at all. And so I think the key here, I'm going to wrap this session up because we're right on 16.30. I think the key, Martin, you mentioned it in your presentation, you've got to know the sport. You've got to know the demands of the sport and what you're testing. Um, and it's got to be something functional. It's no good doing uh, testing strength in a neutral shoulder position if the person's going to throw or if they're going to climb. So please join, with me, join me and thank our great panel. There are, there are some great questions that have come through on Slido, and I apologise that we haven't got to all of your questions. What I'm doing is putting all of these questions together, and we're going to tweet them through the JOSPT Twitter account. So you'll get a chance to interact with those questions and get responses from people all over the world. So please follow the uh, your JOSPT, Y-O-U-R-J-O-S-P-T, hashtag. You'll see the questions and then we'll, we'll aim to get you some answers to those questions. Thank you all very much.